Gordon Strong joins me this week to discuss Chicha Beer and more. This is Beersmith Podcast number 245. This is Beersmith Podcast number 245, and it's late October 2021. Gordon Strong joins me this week to discuss Chicha Beer and more. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent pending Brew Commander is a high quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with a new brew commander. To order yours today, visit BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, I'm happy that the new web-based version of Beersmith is available now at BeersmithRecipes.com. Beersmith for the web lets you build, edit, and brew recipes from any browser, including your desktop, tablet, or your mobile device. The new web version gives you access to tens of thousands of recipes, online recipe editing, advanced water tools, and much more. You can try Beersmith Web free for 30 days by setting up an account at BeersmithRecipes.com. If you purchase a gold, platinum, or pro license, you get both Beersmith Web and the desktop version of Beersmith for one low price. Check out BeersmithRecipes.com now to give Beersmith Web a try. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome back Gordon Strong. Gordon is the President Emeritus and Highest Level Beer Judge for the Beer Judge Certification Program as well as author of the books, Modern Homebrew Recipes and Brewing Better Beer. Gordon, it's great to have you back. How are you doing? Hey, Brad. It's great to be back. Always a pleasure. How are things up in Ohio today? Uh, it's a little cold and rainy, but uh, you know, it's what we like to call fall. Yeah, that's it. Um, I understand, however, you just got back, or rel- relatively recently, anybody's got back from a trip to Ecuador. Yeah, yeah. Um down in uh, South America the last, uh, uh, maybe two, three weeks ago, um, they had had me down there, um, uh, a couple of, uh, years ago and invited me back. So it's, it's good to get back after, uh, some of the lockdowns are lifted. So were you down there, uh, judging, speaking, uh, doing what? Yeah. Um, they have a, they have a, a big competition there, a commercial competition, the, uh, Copa Cerveza Ria. Mitad del Mundo, the um, uh, roughly the Brewers' Cup for the middle of the world, which is they sit there right on the equator. So uh, that's what they call it uh, there, Mitad del Mundo. So is that uh, uh, was it several countries or just Ecuador or who? Yeah, they they can bring in uh, beers from other countries. They get a lot of the Andean uh, countries and some of the ones in uh, in uh, Central America. But uh, it's 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 in uh, Quito, Ecuador, which is actually at like uh, 9,200 feet. So um, yeah, it's almost like a double Denver up in the mountains, huh? Yeah, it's beautiful up there. Hmm. And uh, so you were judging. Uh, did you do some speaking? Uh, what what else did you do up there? Yeah, with uh, with most uh, commercial competitions, they uh, they have a technical program along with it. So um, um, I, I, I talked there and sold a few books on the side and uh, judged and um, you know it's, it, w- it was kind of a lot of these uh, places have uh, a beer week that goes along with um, uh, their event. So there were there was there were several events that were attached to that. And what is the uh, what is the beer scene down like uh, like down there? I should say, uh, is it is it good? Do they have? I mean, is craft beer starting to take off like it is in uh, in many areas in South America? Yeah, um, craft beer is actually uh, pretty popular there, and and I was I was very impressed with the quality, um, better than some of the other countries that I won't really name, but um, uh, most of the things I tried were really good. And like a lot of countries in South America, I'm, I'm, I'm really unsure of the line between home brewer and craft brewer. I mean, mm-hmm. they're all um, 
they don't have malt extract there. So basically all home brewers are all grain brewers. Right. So, so they all, they all sort of have the skills and if they brew on a big enough system, a, a large home brewer is kind of like a small production brewer. And a lot of people have their bars and, uh, places. So, I mean, I just see these beers in the competition. I never really know, um, the, the kind of place they're from, but I just know the, uh, the creativity and the quality they're putting together. So I was, I was pretty impressed with, uh, what I tried there. So, um, did you judge anything unusual at the competition? Yeah, the, um, they were, they were kind of working on, um, this regional style that they called, uh, chicha beer. Um, and, um, I usually, when I'm in a, when I'm in a different place, I usually ask, can I, can I judge beers that have unusual ingredients so I can, um, learn more about the, uh, the local things that they have. And, um, so they put me on that and, you know, sometimes I, uh, um, judge, you know, fruit and spice beers or wood beers or wild beers or, you know, those, those kind of things with specialty ingredients, but this chicha beer was really, uh, kind of different. And, and how is it different? Uh, I assume it's locally made or. (laughs) Yeah, it's it. Well, it's, it's Ecuador, but it's also other countries in the Andes. Um, so it's, it's based on this, um, chicha, is the is is the historical style and and that's the thing that a lot of people have heard of but if you if you say chicha to a beer person they usually would just say oh isn't that the beer where they sort of chew and spit into the mash or 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 something like that and Hmm. and and yeah that's that's the beer they're talking about but they don't really do that anymore that 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 was kind of a sort of a indigenous amazonian um, kind of thing that is really not widely practiced anymore. Um, but it's corn based, um, uh, beer and, um, it can involve a lot of, um, local ingredients, a lot of, uh, herbs and flowers and spices and, uh, things, sugars and things like that. Uh, but it's predominantly corn based. So is uh, it is it is the grist primarily corn? I mean, what what would a grain bill look like? Well, in a in a traditional chicha beer, it would be it, it would be all malted corn. Hmm. So hundred 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 percent corn, then, right? And yeah, uh, and you they, mentioned they, malted. I guess uh, back in the day, a long time ago, the Indians, I, I assume, would chew it, or is that right? To to in place of mashing, or what? what how did that work? Yeah, the the um, I think that was part of it. The, the in a lot of these um, uh, indigenous kind of beers around the world, the 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 brewing process doesn't necessarily follow what you think of as like the mash and the boil and the right. ferment. A lot of times, the, the the stages are mixed. So in this case, it seemed like they don't really do a mash; they just do a really long boil. Hmm. And I kind of contrast that because I was uh, researching um, uh, sati, the the Finnish um, beer, and and they sort of do a long mash and then sort of no boil. Hmm. But I this 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 sort of chicha thing that they're talking about with the chewing, I think I think that also has to do with fermentation. So some. You know, there there is some enzymatic activity going on from um, enzymes in your mouth, but like I said, um, a lot of them sort of treat that as, yeah, that 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 was really a long time ago. People still make chicha now, but they don't really make it like that. Maybe out in the the jungles or something, but it 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 it's kind of like, you know, the 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 mountain folks homebrew. Uh, it's, it, it is what they make in the Andes. And it's, uh, you mentioned malted corn as the base. What are some of the other key ingredients? Um, yeah, it's, um, typically, um, dried, uh, flowers and herbs that they get, 
um, in the Andes. Um, you know, they would they would tell me the name, and I would try to, you know, ask if they had a example of it that I could try, and you know, maybe tell what it is. Or sometimes they had a translation, but I mean, they were using some things like lemon verbena and lemongrass. It, it, they called it lemongrass, but it's no way Asian lemongrass. Hmm. You know they're not going to be growing that up in the, the the Andes, but a lot of different flowers. Like they had this purple flower from the amaranth. Um, mm. they, have, they have violets, and I don't know, um, uh, like um, orange leaves. Um, so uh, various different leaves and flowers and things. Um, mm. So is it so is it more of a spicy finish or is it a flowery sort of a herbal finish? Uh, um, actually, a lot of these it, it's surprising. A lot of these um, um, do have sort of a lemony character to them. Hmm. So if you didn't tell me that they didn't have hops, I, I don't necessarily know that I would have known it because um, a lot of these are bitter and astringent, so they sort of serve the purpose of hops. So, so the, if you, they are made it, without hops though, right? Yeah. Yeah. They are, they are made without hops. And, uh, um, if you, you know, if you, if you hand me a bitter alcoholic drink that sort of tastes citrusy, I'm going to say, well, you know, sure. That's beer. You have hops in it, but I was kind of impressed with, how a lot of these examples seem to uh, mix together these um, sort of native flowers and herbs they had. Um, there's also spices and sugars and could have fruit. Uh, it's a, it's a pretty broad uh, template of a style. And, and, and I think they do it differently in, in different countries. I did talk to, several different brewers and judges from uh, several Andean and Central American countries. And, and they were all describing people making a similar product, but the details, the specifics were different. And I think you mentioned uh, you had some notes about some of the varieties and, and some of the different flavors you were able to pick up, right? Yeah, I since, since I knew they were working on a style definition, I, I, I took... I don't know. I probably got a half a dozen pages of, of notes here from um, the discussion I had before before we sat down to judge this chicha beer. Mm -hmm. I said I, I I told them to please teach me about chicha. So um, it's it's kind of what I told you, but it it, it tends to be a, a, a product that they they have very fresh. They serve it young. They often. You know, they often whip out these plastic containers and, and you know, sort of pour out of them. Hmm. Um, it's often cloudy and, um, you know, it, it can be sweet. It can be a little tangy. Like excessive sourness is, is uh, probably a fault, but um, they don't really get old enough to uh, sort of uh, sour that way. Mm -hmm. But that's the that's the traditional chicha, and what what they were doing is this chicha beer, which is kind of a inspired by chicha, you know, sort of a modern take where you're where you're doing a chicha and beer hybrid. Hmm. So um, the specs they had called out um, it, it it should have at least thirty percent corn and some and at least thirty percent some other malted grain, uh, barley or wheat or rye, uh, typically. So, so many of them are making, I guess, hybrids, right? Or some kind. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's basically what the, the style is, uh, the chicha beer. It's, it's an inspired by the traditional style, but they aren't trying to pass it off as, you know, Hey, this is, this is what the, uh, people did traditionally. Cause because I think they're looking for something that has a little bit more stability, um, right. that looks a little better, that um, um, you know more appeals to modern drinkers. And, and we didn't we didn't talk much about yeast, but are they using uh, modern beer yeast? Are they using some wild yeast? I have no idea. 
uh, yeah, they can, they can, I mean, traditionally it would be, um, uh, something they would do wild and, um, they even described to me how they would go about doing it. They would like cut the outside of a pineapple off and sort of, um, crush that up and put it in a container with like some cheesecloth over it and leave it on the counter for a couple of days. Hmm. Almost like you're making uh, traditional dill pickles. Um, you know, you just kind of let that get started and then use that to ferment. Hmm. So that's what they, that's what they use traditionally. But, uh, hmm. modern, the best thing I could just say is, um, it appears to be mixed fermentation. So you could use beer yeast, you could use um, lactobacillus, you could use brett. So they're trying to adapt those kind of things to the beer um, while still having the corn base. They tend to admit uh, the hops. They tend to um, use a lot of the um, indigenous herbs and spices. Hmm. And what, what were some of the flavor notes you got out of it? What were some of the different variations, I guess, of flavor? Yeah, I'm, I'm I'm checking my notes here. Um, um, some had a lot of, well, they're using different corn as well, so they could look look totally different. If they use like purple corn, for instance, they often have like a a reddish purplish color. <laughs> uh, some had fruit. Um, some from Peru had uh, strawberries, which um, the Peruvians told me were very popular there. Um. Um, some had a lot of, um, spices to them. All spice and clove were among the ones they could translate. Um, uh, they, when they use sugar they they use the sugar they call uh panela, uh, which is kind of like, a, a raw brown sugar. It's really sort of unprocessed, hmm. uh, if you if you go to like uh, Latin American markets, you'll see it as either panela or pianco, um, like the Mexican sugars. They're, they're often um, like in a hard cone, um, but they're 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 a they're a brown sugar. So they could either ferment or add sweetness depending on how they used it. So um, a lot of herbs, a lot of spices. Some used fruit. Um, some people that were experimenting with the style sort of declared a base style. Like I had one that was, they said, oh, here's a Irish red with purple corn. Hmm. I'm not really sure that captured the, the spirit of the category, but it, it, that one wasn't very good. <laughs> Another one said it was like, a used sort of a saison as a base style, which again, seemed kind of weird. I would expect this, this beer to be. You know, kind of like you describe a, a modern American wild beer. You know, it, it may or may not have a real base style. Um, you might just sort of describe the ingredients. And I, I guess one of the interesting things is most of this is made from local ingredients. And of course, one of the challenges, at least in some countries in South America, is getting, you know, fresh hops and, and other ingredients in, right? Yeah, yeah. There, there aren't a lot of hops grown in South America. I mean, they're um, Argentina was sort of starting it, but it, it, it seemed like it, it's a lot of hit and miss or trial and error. Um, there, there, there doesn't seem to be a lot of research, uh, behind it. Not like I saw in New Zealand, for instance, where they actually had a dedicated place where they were doing breeding and, and, mm -hmm. and, and lab trials and things like that. I think they were just planning stuff to see what worked. Um, they, they have trouble, um, getting liquid yeast, the variety of yeast that they get is, uh, tends to be fairly limited. So I see a lot of people with, uh, using various dry yeasts. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's why I sort of mentioned that this, this one, um, the, they, they have, they have a traditional way that they sort of captured sort of the, uh, indigenous, uh, fermenters and, uh, you know, the wild yeast, uh, the pineapple method. Um, but the modern beer, they are, you know, I'd say definitely uh, a mixed culture. Saccharomyces, lactobacillus, bretonomyces, any of those could show up. Well, you uh, you sampled quite a few of these. Were any of them quite good, I guess? 
Yeah, the um so like I judged that flight um and we had one that um I mean I wrote down almost everything they wrote because it it was so good. It was uh 60% corn, 30% pills malt, 10% raw wheat. Uh, 15 minute boil, no hops using Ecuadorian herbs, flowers, and spices. Hmm. And they did a split fermentation with lacto in one and uh, saccharomyces in the other. Then they, they blended it and bottle conditioned it with Brett. And it had this sort of beautiful, I mean, it, it, it looked to me almost like a, a, a Duval, you know, a, a Belgian golden strong. It was this really sort of pale straw color. It was brilliantly clear. It had this huge head on it. It was just a, it was just a delightful beer. And I, I really wouldn't have known that it didn't have any uh, uh, hops in it. Hmm. And so that, that one won our category. Um, and uh, it, it, it went on and, uh, um, it actually took best of show. Wow. I judge That's best of cool. show. Yeah, it was. And the interesting thing is like, you know, there are five judges on the panel and, um, I had judged it. So n- normally when I'm judging, um, in a best of show, I never say anything about any beers that I judged in a previous round. I right. let other people comment on them first and, um, you know, we're, you often knock them down to like the, there's like maybe the last eight or so. And then people start talking about what they really like. And everybody kept picking this up and holding it up and looking at it. And, you know, it's just, it was just beautiful. And, uh, people were talking about it. So it was, it was, it was kind of a slam dunk as to, to which one it was, it was everybody's number one. And, um, and this one I think was, a came out of a brewery you mentioned perhaps. Yeah, yeah. The um, uh, the the funny part about the story was um, I was um, I had an unexpected free day in Ecuador. Um, uh, people were doing like different trips around, and I was I was going to do a sightseeing trip, and uh, um, the bus turned out to leave from a different place. So I didn't get that. And I I saw some people in the lobby and I'm like, Hey, do you have plans? And they're like, uh, yeah, we're going to go to this brewery. It's like, uh, cool. You got a, you got a room in the car. Sure. Come on. And, um, you know, long story short, we, we show up at this place called Catania, um, on the outskirts of Quito that, um, uh, was just this little husband and wife farmhouse brewery. Um, you know, it was their house and they had a front, um, uh, area that was a bar and buildings in the back where they were brewing. <laughs> and we kind of spent all afternoon with them and they were, they were giving us some, um, good beers and, and they had a, um, uh, a chicha beer. So I, I tried that and I had them describe it to me cause I was in the back of my mind. I was wondering, well, I wonder if it's this, uh, this beer that I really liked and they were and they described it differently and it tasted different. So it was, it, it was a different beer. Hmm. Um, um, so I thought, oh, okay. So it probably came from somebody else cause they hadn't had the, uh, the awards yet. So, you know, we spent all day with them and I took a lot of pictures and I'll probably write an article about it, mm-hmm. uh, after I get some, uh, some more details. But, um, uh, then Later that night was the uh, awards festival, and they're announcing uh, the winners. and And sure enough, these guys won the the best of show with the chicha beer. Hmm. It just turns out it was like they they make more than one, and that wasn't the one we tried when we were at the brewery, hmm. because I, I definitely would have recognized it. Yeah. So um, I guess it's good I didn't know it was them, because then you know they were they were surprised. I didn't. You know, it's not like they handed me the beer that I judged and said, oh, yeah, um, you know, you'll be happy, uh, you know, with the results. So, you know, it, it was a surprise to them. But, uh, you know, to find out that I had gone to the brewery that, that, that brewed the, the beer I really liked was just, uh, it was just a happy coincidence. And uh, can you describe for us the brewery and, and the process they went through to make the beer? Because I, I, I bet it was, you said it was quite small, I guess, right? Yeah, it was, um, you know, it was almost like a 
a, a large garage, um, you know, a tall one enough that could hold um, some cylindroconical fermenters. But it wasn't that big. Um, but I, I got to see a lot of the ingredients. They had this, like, this malted corn. Uh, imagine if you, like... Um, you know, looked at hominy or, or, you know, something like that, the corn that's all enormous. Sure. Uh, you know, um, it, it kind of looked like that, but it was dried. And I'd heard that some brewers malted the corn themselves, but he said that he got it, uh, from a, from a farmer that way. So the farmer would, uh, malt it for him. Um, and they had this uh, bag of, um, you know, their, their, you know, the, the, it's kind of like the Colonel's secret blend, you know, it's the, uh, 17 herbs and spices mix. Mm. Um, but you know, it was this bag of flowers. So we're like picking through it and we're looking at things and like, Oh, what's this like little purple thing? And, you know, and everybody pulls out their phones and they're trying to Google translate these things. And, um, you know, amaranth flower I'm like okay so it has an english name but I, I have no idea what that is yeah but it was uh you know it was just a, a mix and so i was just kind of really impressed and you know if we if we if we think about other um sort of herb and spice beers that are unhopped and you kind of wonder well i wonder what that tastes like you know you make a beer without hops that has to taste awful it's like no, the, these things really did taste good. You can you can put together some of these um, uh, herbs in a way that um, really do have a lot of the the same effects of hops. They, you know, they're bitter, they're aromatic. Um, you know, they have a they have a good flavor. Um, so I was I was I was impressed to see. Um, how they, how they got the corn and how they handled that. Cause some people said they, uh, malted it themselves and it sounded like they almost were doing, um, you know, they do a steeping process and then, um, you know, let it germinate warm and right. then, you know, then they take this, but then they, then they just, they don't really, like I said, they don't really mash it. They're really just kind of boiling it. Hmm. And was um, that the case here too? Are they just doing a simple, I mean, going straight into the boil with the, with the malted corn? Um, I think, um, they're, they're mashing because they're using these other grains as well. Um, hmm. and, um, but they, they did say they, um, they only did a 15 minute boil, so they're not doing like the long traditional. So if they're, if they're not doing a boil and, and the way this thing looked, um, um, bright, um, they really, they really had to been doing a mash to, to, to get that. But, um, um, they don't all have to do it that way. Uh, there is a, there is a range and, and people are, like I said, people are still playing around with it, um, um, as a style, hmm. the, the herbs, um, you know, they might go into the, um, they might go into the boil, they might go into the fermenter, um, used in different ways, but y there is definitely, uh, an aroma and flavor from them. And it, 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 it None of these really, I would say, tasted like, you know, if you expect them to taste like grass clippings, you know, to have a real green chlorophyll kind of um, taste. Um, I didn't really get that in any any of the beers. Hmm. Well, that's good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, um, right. Because uh, it's it, it's easy for people to dismiss something they haven't tried just you know, oh, you know, here's the list of ingredients. Oh, that's got to taste awful. Uh, well, no, no, go ahead and try it because they're actually transforming the ingredients uh, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. The other thing that kind of surprised me when I was judging the beer was um, some of the ones I judged said they were 100% corn. And I thought like, wow, these are going to have a big corn flavor because if you did that in the U.S. and used like, um, 
you know, the uh, flaked maize uh, or something like that, yeah. you'd really have a, a prominent corn flavor. You know, it uh, corn definitely has, you know, it's almost like a corn on the cob flavor. These, none of these beers really had much in the way of malt. It was, it was always the, the herbs and spices and, um, fermentation that was sort of carrying the beer. So, um, the beers you're judging are basically a modern take on a historical beer style. Um, have you seen yeah. other places where people are doing that? I know, for example, here in the U S there's been, you know, resurgence in Gr- Grzycki, which is, a, I believe a Polish style, right? Yeah, yeah, Polish slash German, depending on uh, what year you're talking about. You know, those yeah. those borders were kind of fluid, but um, um, yeah, um, you know, I think it's actually more like if you if you think about Gruet, the you know sort of from northwestern Europe and you know kind of the Low Countries in the Middle Ages. Um, you know, if you talk about like unhopped beers, but we don't really know a whole lot about those styles. Um, but it got me, it got me to thinking that the people that are, are doing these have their like secret blend of herbs and spices that they're using and they are achieving beer like effects. So it's certainly plausible to me that and uh, the Groot people were doing that. And I, and I think, you know, I've seen sort of modern recreations and, um, I just sort of wanted to draw the distinction between people that are sort of doing reenactments, you know, it's like, okay, I'm making this like they did when this was made is way different than, Hey, I'm sort of inspired by this and I'm trying to use as many of the ingredients and maybe a nod to the methods, but I'm, I'm making a modern product with, um, uh, the influence from the style. So, uh, modern takes on Groot, I've seen like that. Uh, I mentioned before the Finnish Sati, which was always a farmhouse product. And it's almost by definition, you couldn't make that in a brewery with brewer's yeast. Uh, but some brewers are making sort of modern takes on it and they are doing it that way. So it wouldn't fit the, strict historic definition of the style but they're 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 doing sort of modern versions that aren't the the farmhouse products because the one thing i notice of all these different like the the chicha the sati the gruit is you know these are turn and burn these are these are things that you're going to make it and you're going to drink it within a week um yeah, so uh, brewing's kind of a hard thing to do. So it's nice to have something around for a while, not just sort of drink it as fast as you can make it. Mm. So I appreciate the the attempts at modernizing. Is there? A, are you seeing this happen on a commercial scale in some places, or no? Um, yeah the 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 Finns are doing the the sati. Um, uh, you can still find it. Um, you know, in, in, in farmhouses and such, but some brewers are trying to make it. And I, and I have seen examples where people have put out, uh, Groots in, in the U S, uh, the kind of a special product or even, you know, there's, there, there's some breweries that, um, I'm thinking of this one. I think it's around the St. Louis area called uh, scratch that, uh, um, makes beer with, uh, I don't know if they call it like foraged ingredients, mm-hmm. uh, but they're, 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 you know, they're, they're finding stuff in nature and, and, and putting those in the beers. So it's, it's kind of like they're taking that inspiration, but you know, there, there's going to be the historians and the, and the sort of the, um, you know, the people that want to draw the hard line and say, no, 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 this isn't how it was done, you know, in the year 800. Yeah. They put, uh, they put, you know, heated rocks into a pail of water or something like that to make the beer right. And stuff like that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and things like that. And, you know, there's, uh, if, okay. So some of these are making them in more modern circumstances and, you know, they have more scientific knowledge. So, um, you know, maybe they're updating the processes to things that, um, they know will work faster rather than just the, the sort of the trial and error. So it, it is kind of interesting. 
Um, as a quick aside, I, I think you judged some meads while you were down there. Did you see anything interesting there? I'm always uh, always a big fan. In fact, you enjoy drinking many of my meads, I think, right? Uh, yes, I did. And uh, <laughs> if I play my cards right, maybe I will uh, in the not too uh, distant future. Yeah, but you uh, did you judge any uh, interesting meads while you were down there? I did. I did judge meads. Um, and... Um, I didn't judge any that seemed to be really stellar, but actually when I was at the, uh, when I was at the, uh, this, this, this brewery that won, I noticed they had like uh, mango blossom honey there. Uh-huh. And I said, man, do I want to ferment that? I mean, they weren't, <laughs> they weren't making meat out of it, but I said, okay, if I come back, you need to, you know, you need to go get like a bucket of this and we're yeah, going to make you send me 60 pounds of it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. You know, go, yeah, go, <laughs> go, go get a large uh, bucket of this because we're going to, we're going to make up a batch of mead. Uh, I have no nice. idea how much, uh, how much it costs, but I tasted the honey. I didn't taste it fermented, but it really, it really did have the, you know, imagine, you know, the best orange blossom you had, and instead of having the sort of the orange flowers, it actually has like a mango kind of tropical uh, uh, aspect to it. It was very fruity, very floral. You know, it's it's just the kind of thing that you imagine would be delicious. And uh, I would just want sounds to Sounds fantastic. That. Yeah. You know, I don't want, they're like, well, what kind of mead do you want to make? I was like, no, I just, let me just put some yeast and some water in this and like, let me just taste this honey. Yeah. It would be, it would be wonderful on its own. So that was, that was like my, my mead find of the trip. I didn't, I didn't actually judge that. Well, I'm, I'm disappointed you didn't pick up 60 pounds for me, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's the, uh, uh, probably the know. shipping's a little high though. Well, the TSA also sort of frowns on that in your Prob- carry. Probably so. Yeah. Um, I had some really nice. I had some really nice Australian honey taken away from me in New Zealand. I'm like, uh, aren't you guys all buddies? Like, no, we're completely different. You can't bring honey on the island. I'm interesting. Like, I, I don't know why. Is honey a big threat? It, yeah, I, I don't think you can plant it, right? Well, they just don't want agricultural products um, from other places. So, yeah. you know, I had I had honey confiscated from me in New Zealand that came from Australia, wow. and I'm like you're going to take this home and you're going to put this on your toast. I know it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> well, um, well back to the Chicha style, what's the prospect of something like that becoming a BJCP style in the future? That was, uh, that was kind of a, uh, an interesting, um, uh, aspect I had because they were, they were starting on a write up, but none of the write up really had any sort of sensory information. So I was trying to capture it, but, at this point, I wasn't really able to get um, enough of a sort of a commonality to it. So what I actually suggested to those guys is like, hey, uh, maybe you ought to have like a conference, bring people from uh, different countries that make this and try different samples and see if there's like a core element that we could all sort of agree on. Because right now it's 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 written kind of as a framework, and it, it would be a very open ended style. I like it as I like it as an entry category, but I have no idea how to characterize it. So yeah, I'll you mentioned have, there's a huge variety, right? Yeah, there is, and and when you're writing a style description, if if for every attribute of the beer, the answer would be anything goes, yeah. Then then the resulting style description isn't very helpful. Yeah. So I, th- I think they're onto something. I, I, I really do think it could lead to some, it's the, it's the kind of thing I would like to be able to recognize. I think they need to work on the idea more. So I, I can't, I can't wait to go down and, uh, try it again with those guys. Um, because, uh, the, the, the samples I tried were really good. So I think, I think they're kind of onto something. Well, um, speaking of styles, I think you're in the middle of working on some kind of a BJCP style guideline update, right? You've been working on it for uh, probably a year now or more, right? Um, yeah, I, I, 
I swear I talked to you about this like two or three years ago. <laughs> and, um, well, when we were, we, we, I had you on one time talking about provisional styles, which you have published a handful of provisional styles. Uh, but that, you mentioned that, at the true. time you were, you were, I think you were just starting to work on a new revision perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I can say it's further along than in the middle of, I think, I think it's, it's, it's virtually done. I think, I think it is just about done. It needs a little bit more, uh, review. So it'll definitely be out this year. It'll be uh 2021 BJCP style update. Mm -hmm. Um, it'll be a minor update, not like the, the, the sweeping revision like we had in 2015. Right. Um, because that tends to upset the exam program, all the people studying, you know. Um, well, and people like me that make software have a lot of data entry to do. <laughs> you know. oh. Yeah. But, so uh, so what, 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 what are the things we might look forward to? I, I, what are, are there some new styles added, uh, revisions, what? Yeah, um, well, all the descriptions are basically rewritten. So okay. um, any any anything that appeared to be confusing when people tried to use it, some of the specialty styles, um, you know, based on questions that we'd get about where do I enter my beer? And I have, um, you know, we, we would see people being confused. So we tried to, to clarify that, um, some of the, uh, sour beers are getting, um, uh, a rework. I, I had worked with some of the, uh, milk the funk people to get, uh, their, um, their, their comments. And, and we tried to, uh, work some of those in there. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I had mentioned before, uh, as far as renaming, um, some of the, some of the Belgian styles, um, we're getting away from using, uh, the name Trappist on anything since, yeah. the, since the, uh, the monks, uh, Tra Trappist like is that. copyrighted or trademarked or something, right? Yeah, it's a it's a protected appellation. I think is the yeah. the right term for it. But I mean, we aren't selling a commercial product, so it. I mean, we can utter the name, but I think I think their I think their concern is that commercial breweries could then look at our guidelines and name their beers according to our guidelines, and and the breweries would be infringing. Uh, which isn't our intent for how the guidelines are used at all, but um, you know why? Why even have that as a problem? Yeah, I get it. So um, there'll be a, a couple minor changes. We've we've moved some of the provisional styles into the main um, guidelines. Uh, a, a couple of, I mean, we 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 took like one of the. Um, regional styles like the Italian grape ale and made that more widely accessible to people that want to use any grape variety in any country. Hmm. Um, so things like that, things that should allow for people to, to do more things with specialty beers. Um, so a focus on uh, clarity, I guess, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. And 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 just updating some of the some of the descriptions were probably getting close to twenty years old. So we took a hard look at um, how some things were described. Um, so I basically rewrote everything. Mm. All new examples. Um, you know, some will be the same, of course, but um, we did go through and uh, and look at all that. So I don't have an exact release date, um, but it will be in twenty twenty one. So, so that's, uh, you got a couple months left and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I'm confident enough with, uh, where it stands. I'm uh, predicting but, sometime in November or December. That's prediction. yeah. I, I, I think I would take that bet. Are you, um, uh, you, so you giving odds on that? Yeah. <laughs> so, so Gordon, uh, your closing thoughts on, uh, you know, some of the new beer styles, some of the exciting things coming out of South America, uh, or Central America, uh, what, what, what have you learned? Yeah. Um, I, I, I actually kind of learned that, um, uh, a lot of, a lot of places I go, um, they're using your software. I, I, I see it show up in a lot of places. So, uh, um, you know, good on you. Keep supporting, uh, 
keep supporting the language translations. Um, uh, but they're 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 making some interesting beers. Um, I find um, some places are trying to be just like the U.S. and do whatever the latest trendy thing is. But I'm also sort of encouraged to see styles that are hard to find in the U S um, you know, you walk into a bar and all they have is IPAs, is, you know, that's, I that's like here. I, that's the problem here. I think. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I mean, I like, I like an IPA, but I don't always feel like an IPA and I, and I would like a little variety and, and that's, that's a good reason to be a home brewer. No, Gordon, you will drink IPA all time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well that's okay because IPA is coming just to mean beer. Yeah. If you, if you can have, a, if you can have like a malty IPA with no bitterness, then, uh, it, it really does just mean beer. Mm. So, uh, I, I, I think the South Americans are, are, uh, embracing the roots of craft beer. Um, some of the things that we've, uh, I think we might've forgotten in this country as we've grown, um, um, so I'd, I'd love to see, I love to see them doing interesting things. I love to see how they're trying to adapt local ingredients and innovate in, in their beer. Um, they all, they all really want to have their own styles, but say, think about the beer first. The styles will come later. Um, we're not, we're not creating styles because we're trying to help you grow your market. We're trying to create styles because these are things that you make and people like. Mm -hmm. So I'm encouraging them to always sort of, uh, stick to the roots, go, um, brew great beer and, um, uh, don't forget about the, the styles of the world. So, um, I think, uh, I think they got no place to go, but up. Well, Gordon, uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show and taking the time today. Thank you again for being here. Yeah, it's always great to be with you, Brad. And today my guest is Gordon Strong. He's president emeritus of the Beer Judge Certification Program, uh, also author of the books Modern Homebrew Recipes and Brewing Better Beer. Thanks again, Gordon. My pleasure. A big thank you to Gordon Strong for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And also the Brew Commander, the new brew house controller from Blickman Engineering. It's available in electric and gas propane models. The patent-pending Brew Commander is a high-quality brew house controller that offers automated step mashing, boil timers, precision temperature control, and advanced settings. Command your brew day with the new Brew Commander. To order yours today, visit BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, the new Beersmith web version of Beersmith is available at BeersmithRecipes.com. Beersmith for the web lets you edit and brew recipes from any browser, including your desktop, tablet, or your mobile device. You can try Beersmith web for free for 30 days by setting up an account at BeersmithRecipes.com. If you purchase a gold, platinum, or pro license, you get both Beersmith web and the Beersmith desktop version for one low price. Go to BeersmithRecipes.com to give Beersmith Web a try. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.